the King of glory, the King above all kings. Yeah, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life. That I would be set free. You've done for me
spoke a word you were singing over me you have been so so good to me for i took a breath you breathed your life in me you have been so so kind to me oh the overwhelming never ending reckless love of god oh it chases me down fights till i'm found leaves the 99 i couldn't earn it i don't deserve it Still you give yourself away Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God was your foe, still your love fought for me. You have been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. Lord, you have been so, so kind to me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it. Still you give yourself away Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God, yeah Oh There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up coming after me there's no wall you won't kick down lie you won't tear down coming after me there's no shadow you won't light up mountain you won't climb up coming after me there's no wall you won't kick down lie you won't tear down coming after me there's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves a 99. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it. Till you give yourself away Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God
out like a hurricane I am a tree Bending beneath The weight of His wind and mercy All of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions Eclipsed by glory I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me. Oh, how he loves us all. Oh, how he loves us. How he loves us
gave his life what more could he give oh how he loves you oh how he loves me oh how he loves you Scripture says deep calls out to deep. Let the deep within you, let the depths of your spirit cry out to the one that your heart loves. Let the depths of your spirit cry out to the one who created you, who designed you with a purpose and a plan, who designed you to do something in this time period. the great evangelist Billy Graham of all of the truths in God's word what is the truth that speaks to him the loudest and the clearest and he says Jesus loves me this I know for the Bible tells me so it's that simple folks and that's the message that we need to tell people it's that simple Jesus loves me Jesus loves you the Bible tells you so that'll change your life right there can be seated. I'm going to ask if our, our men will come up and we will honor the Lord with our tithes and offerings. Thanks, guys. Dennis, would you bless the offering? Father, we thank you for this day that you have bestowed upon us. Lord, we ask that you will be with, be with each one of someone here today. Take these offerings now that we are about to present to you, Lord. Use them in a way that is fitting to your kingdom. These things we pray in your precious name. Amen. Amen. I heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like. But I heard the tender whispers of love in the dead of night and you tell me that you're pleasing
reason that I'm never alone. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. Searching for answers far and wide, but I know we're all searching for answers. Only you provide because you know just what I need before I say a word. You're a good, good father, that's who you are. It's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are, you are perfect, you are perfect in all of your ways, you are perfect in all of your ways, you are perfect in all of your ways, to us, love so undeniable I I can hardly speak peace so unexplainable I I can hardly think as you call me deeper still as you call me deeper still as you call me deeper still into love 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 your good good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you are and i'm loved by you it's who i am it's who i am it's who i am that many of us are on. Who am I? Why am I here? What's my purpose? There it is right there. It's, it's that simple. God created you to have fellowship with him. And if you have fellowship with him, you're, you're fulfilling your purpose. He's got other things he wants you to do too, but that's your ultimate purpose is to have intimate fellowship with the Father. That's who you are. Amen. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. We'll go ahead and uh, dismiss the kids to their classes. without microphones. I don't know how they did it. Is it on? Praise God. Well, before we go any farther, I want to thank Butch and Dave for making the meal for the men's breakfast yesterday and John for speaking. That was good, really good. And we had some visitors, so that's always neat when we can uh, spend time with brothers 
uh, and sisters, but not at the men's breakfast, <laughs> brothers and sisters uh, from other bodies. And uh, that was really cool to have them with us. And uh, also, before I forget, I want to mention that we are having prayer at the church tonight for anybody that can make it. Um, I always enjoy those times of prayer. God always meets us here. And uh, so, 6 o'clock tonight here at the church, if you can make it out for prayer, it would be good. Well, uh, last week we had the missionaries who enjoyed the missionaries. That was awesome. Didn't they do a great job? I loved how they were able to um, speak to our children and then also keep everybody else's attention, too. Because um, I'm a, a child at heart, so uh, they were able to keep my attention, and that was pretty cool. But they did an awesome job, and Jackie told them, she said, I think of all the missionaries I've heard, you're some of the best missionaries I've heard. And that's saying something. We've heard a lot of missionaries over the years, but they just did an excellent job. It's online, so if you weren't here, you can, uh, you can listen to Bud, the uh, puppet yesterday. <laughs> yeah, Jackie said he... He had me so convinced with that puppet that I found myself, when the puppet looked my way, looking at him right in the eye because I didn't want him to think I was being rude and not paying attention. And she's like, wait a minute, this is that puppet. He doesn't realize you're not looking at him. So it cracked me up whenever um, she held up the missionary card and held it up like that, and he was going like this. And he said, you do realize these aren't real, don't you? So it cracked me up. But yeah, they were, they were really good. But continue to be praying for the McClure family as they go around and continue to raise their support so they can get out in the field. And as you remember, they're really trying to minister to the whole family, but especially minister to children. Because in a lot of countries, the kids are kind of forgotten about. I mean, they minister to the parents, and the kids, they just kind of let them go do their thing. Well, guess what? Those years are important years. Amen. If those children get saved as children, they have their whole life ahead of them to work for the Lord. So that's why, you know... All the, the people that have worked with our children here at this church, don't think that that is a small ministry. That's a huge ministry. That's a, that's a great investment. Well, anyway, um, two weeks ago, I spoke to you, and I mentioned at one point in my sermon uh, about God building his house. And I kind of want to just pick up on that phrase about God building his house. And this is not really a continuation of that sermon, but it's it's picking up on that phrase that God's building his house because I think that's something that we really need to be thinking about this time because it's important to God. And as we get closer and closer to the last days, that needs to be a priority for us, that God is building his, his house and it needs to be a priority in our lives and in our hearts. It's always been a priority to God. Um, but I believe if there was ever a time for us to take that serious, now is the time. And that means different things. For one thing, it means witnessing to other people. I mean, that's a part of it, building his house. But, uh, you know, telling people that God loves them, some people have never heard that. Some people are feeling very unloved during these times, and they need to know that someone loves them. And God has not forgotten about them and knows exactly where they are and loves them deeply. And they need to hear that, and they need to hear about his offer of salvation, you know, that they can come to know him in an intimate way. But that also means about working on us. God's building his house. So that, that, that's about him working on us too because Jesus said, I will build my house. And I believe we're in the last days. I truly believe that. And God is building his church and it's a priority to him. So it should be a priority to us. So um, we need to decide, are we going to cooperate with him in his building this house? Are we going to choose to work with him as he builds this house, as he builds this house, because this is a house of God. So are we going to work with him and cooperate with him, or are we going to ignore what's a priority to him in these days? Because he will have his house, and I don't know about you, but I want to work with him as he's doing this work. I don't want him to have to use somebody else to do what he actually created me to do, because I wasn't willing to work with him, and he couldn't count on me to fulfill my purpose. I want him to be able to count on me and not too long ago, I was reading in Psalm 78, and a certain scripture jumped out at me. Have you ever had that where you're reading through a scripture and something just jumps out? And you've read it before, but for some reason it didn't jump out at you other ways, other times like it did that way. Well, I had that happen to me. This just jumped out at me. And uh, now there was a time in my life whenever, yeah, I was faithful to read God's word every day, but I would read his word and then I would, you know, check it off, check, that's done for the day. 
And then one day I realized that I was more concerned about making that check than I was about really getting something out of it. You know, I just needed to, every day I, I would spend time with the Lord in prayer and I would spend time in his word. So I'd read that, check that off. Okay, that's done for the day. Um, but I felt like at that point in my life, God was saying, you know, it's great that you're doing this, but you need to really be listening. What am I trying to tell you through this word? Don't just read it. I'm trying to tell you something here, you know? So I felt like God was saying, instead of just being so concerned about checking that off, really uh, think about what I'm trying to tell you uh, here. And so, you know, that, that day I realized I was going to start to do things differently. You know, it, it was a daily discipline of mine, and that's a good thing. You know, daily disciplines are good. They help to keep you on track. So that's all good. But if you're not careful, those daily disciplines can just become a law that you set up in your life, just something you do because that's what you do and that's what you've always done, just kind of like the Sabbath. Um, you know, in Mark 2, 23, it says, one Sabbath day, as Jesus was walking through some grain fields, his disciples began breaking off heads of grain to eat. But the Pharisees said to Jesus, look, why are they breaking the law by harvesting grain on the Sabbath? And Jesus said to them, haven't you ever read the scriptures, what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He went into the house of God during the days when Abiathar was high priest and broke the law by eating the sacred loaves of bread that only the priests are allowed to eat. He also gave some to his companions. Then Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made to meet the needs of man and not people to meet the requirements of the Sabbath. So the son of man is Lord even over the Sabbath. So what's going on here? Well, Jesus isn't upset about keeping the Sabbath. That's not what's going on. Um, the Old Testament Jews, they recognize the last day of the week as their Sabbath day. Modern day Christians tend to recognize the first day of the week as the Sabbath day in honor of Christ's resurrection. But we should, as God commanded us, lay aside one day in the seven to worship God and to refresh ourselves. It's important for us to do that. Um, it's important for us physically. It's important for us mentally. It's important for us spiritually. Um, and why did I say one day in the week? Well, let me just say something. We recognize Sunday as the Sabbath day. And, and I come to the house of God and I, I worship God and I recognize um, this is the Sabbath day. But if you want to know if this is a day of rest for me, it's not. <laughs> It starts really early, it goes real late, and it's usually bang, 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 because we have the first service, and immediately after the first service, we have the youth service. After the youth service, we have the afternoon service, and after the afternoon service, we have the prayer service. And, you know, it's not a day of rest. So I feel like, although I'm recognizing it as the Sabbath in that I come here and worship the Lord, it's not doing anything for, my, for me, for my body to rest. So I take Monday as my Sabbath day. Now, it's very tempting for me on Mondays, especially during the warm weather, to spend that entire day outside working because I love working outside. I love working in the garden. I love landscaping. I love all of it. And I could just spend all day out there, um, you know, pushing the wheelbarrow and sweating by my brow and loving every minute of it. But I'm not getting any rest. And so I have had to make myself take that day as a day of rest because I feel like I need to honor God in that way. And I feel like it's good for me mentally. It's good for me physically. It's good for me spiritually. I spend that time with the Lord, not the entire day, 24 hours, but I spend time with the Lord. So it's just good for me um, to do that. I had someone come to me one time and they were really furious because they go to a Seventh-day Adventist church and how dare we come to church on Sunday rather than Saturday. And it was a big, big deal to that person. You know, um, I feel like you need to take a day of rest. Okay. Uh, yes, traditionally we take Sunday and, and for many of you, Sunday is your Sabbath and you come here and you worship the Lord and then you go to eat and then you spend the rest of the day resting. And that's your Sabbath. Um, for me, I need to take Monday as my Sabbath. So, but God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. You can see that two places, Genesis 2, 3, Exodus 20, verse 11. And God established the Sabbath at creation before he even gave the Old Testament Jews their laws. So this was established a long time. And uh, 
You never see any place in Scripture that Jesus canceled or eliminated the principle of a day of rest. He didn't. He only condemned the Pharisees because of their misuse of it, okay? And maybe someday I'll get into this more, but that's really not the purpose of my message today. I just want to tell you that because I'm saying that sometimes you can take something and set it up and make it a law um, like I was trying to make that check mark, okay? That became a law to me. But if I just read through it and make the check mark and I'm concerned about getting through it, I'm not really getting anything out of it. So what I needed to do is I needed to say, okay, God, I'm going to take things a little slower and maybe I'm not even going to get through this whole scripture because maybe I'll be reading through that scripture and halfway through something will jump out at me and God will say, I want you to dig a little deeper into this. And so then I take that word and then I, I research it a little bit and find out, God, what are you really trying to say? I might read it in different versions. I mean, go and look it up in the concordance and find out what is God really trying to say in this. And maybe at the end of the day, I didn't get to check that off. But that's okay because God spoke to me deeper that day because I took the time to really dig and see what he was trying to say to me. Well, I was reading through Psalm 78, and that's what happened to me when I was reading through this scripture. Now, um, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Asaph wrote Psalm 78. Who was Asaph? He was... Uh, during the time of Solomon, David, during those times, he was a musician. He was also a seer, or what we, they would say seer. Today we would say prophet. Okay, so he was, he was a musician. He was also a seer. His was the longest of all of the Psalms. And uh, so he was prophetic. And if you read through this Psalm, you're going to find out that basically what he's doing, he's warning the people that history should not repeat itself in this area, Okay. And that the people of Israel should never be unbelieving again. And that the people of Israel had been told the things that God did for them. And they're supposed to tell their children. And they're supposed to tell their children. And so on and so on and so on. Why? Well, let's find out. Psalm 78, verse 7 and 8. It says that they might, one, set their hope in God. And two, not forget the works of God. But three... Keep his commandments. And then if you go to verse 8, it says, And might, four, not be as their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation. A generation that, and this is the important part, set not their heart aright, and whose spirit was not steadfast with God. Let me read that part again. A generation that set not their heart aright, and whose spirit was not steadfast with God. Now, we talked not long ago about setting our heart and setting our faith. And determine ahead of time that come what may, whatever it is, I will have faith in God. I will trust God. I will continue to have hope in God. And we talked about making a firm decision that we're going to stay loyal to him. We're going to live by his promises. We're going to live by his commands. We're going to live by his standards and the principles of his word until the day that he comes and takes us home. That's something we're going to do. Setting our heart aright, making our mind up. And God will be with you during the trials that you go through. You're going to still go through trials, but God will be with you during those times. But he won't make up your mind for you that you're going to trust him during those times. Only you can do that. Only you can do that. He can't make your mind up for you that you're going to trust him no matter what comes. Now... Some people have had parents that, you know, raised them in the church and they were a godly influence and they were faithful to tell you about the Lord and all of those things. Um, but still, you haven't determined in your own heart that you yourself are going to set your heart aright and you're going to be faithful to the Lord, come what may. Um, you know, it's not good enough for him to be your parents' God. You know what I mean? He has to be your God. We can't make it to heaven on our parents' coattails. We need to have our own relationship with Jesus. We can't make it on our parents or our grandparents. And I believe that God doesn't take it lightly when we don't trust him. I think it's important to him that we trust him. And today's a day that could challenge that. Are we going to trust him during these days or aren't we? There are a lot of people that are living in terrible fear when they don't have to. I think that's a trick of the enemy. The enemy wants people to be living in fear, and our culture is not helping anything. They're trying to make you fearful. They're bombarding you with things to make you fearful. 
It's in the news. It's in the newspaper. It's everywhere you look. And if you listen to it, you'll be living in fear because they're successful. I'll tell you the truth. I don't listen to it. I choose not to. I think it's just smarter not to. I just feel like we can't believe half of what they say anyway. So I choose to listen to what the Lord is saying to me. Okay, I listen to sources where I feel like I'm gonna, my spirit's going to be fed, my heart's going to be fed, I'm going to be encouraged, because there's a lot of things out there that can make you depressed and discouraged, and there's a lot of people that are living in discouragement. It's like uh, rampant everywhere. It's crazy. But it's because they're feeding themselves the wrong stuff. You need to feed your heart what's going to encourage your heart, and that's things of the Lord. Listen to praise and worship music. Read the word of the Lord. Listen, if you're going to listen to, good, to news, listen to news that's going to be uplifting. Don't listen to stuff that's going to discourage you. I'm not talking about sticking your head in the sand. I'm just saying don't believe lies. You know, that's all I'm saying. Listen to the truth. So um, today I want to look at a certain tribe uh, called Ephraim in the Bible. Now, what's so special about Ephraim? And I feel like we need to take a quick little... Uh, history lesson, and I don't want to make this real lengthy, but I want to just let you know who Ephraim is and why the tribe of Ephraim is important. Okay, so a real quick lesson here in Genesis 18 verses 9 through 15 and Genesis 21 verses 1 to 7. I'm not going to read it. You can read that on your own. But God promises Abraham that he's going to make his name great and that through him all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. Okay, and then Genesis 17, 16, God promised to Abraham that Sarah was going to be the mother of nations. Not of a nation, but nations, okay? So then, uh, the sons of Abraham. Who are the sons of Abraham? Well, there's two. There's Ishmael and there's Isaac. Ishmael is a son from the union with Abraham's concubine, Hagar. Isaac is a son from his union with his wife, Sarah. And his wife was the one to whom the promise was given, that she was going to be the mother of nations. Okay? So, um, who are the sons of Isaac? We got Esau and we got Jacob. And if you were to read Genesis 25, 21 to 23, uh, the Lord answers Isaac's prayer and Rebekah became pregnant with twins. But the two children struggled with each other in her womb. So she went to ask the Lord about it. Why is this happening to me, she asked. And the Lord told her, I'm gonna point that part out. And the Lord told her, the sons in your womb will become two nations. From the very beginning, the two nations will be rivals. One nation will be stronger than the other and your older son will serve your younger son. The Lord told her, your older son will serve your younger son. The reason why I point that out is because we're not going to get into the whole story because it would take too much time. But if you look at the whole way that uh, the very first one that was born, even though they were twins, the one that was born first was Esau. Okay, so he would be the firstborn. He would be the one with the birthright. But um, through a series of events, Rebecca and uh, Jacob work it out that Jacob is the one that gets the birthright, okay? So you can look at Rebecca and say, wow, she was a conniving woman. But you need to remember something. God said to her, the sons in your womb will become two nations. From the very beginning, the two nations will be rivals. One nation will be stronger than the other, and your older son will serve your younger son. So she's thinking, hmm, God told me before I even birthed these children that the older would serve the younger. So I think that's partly in what, what she's doing there with all of the things that happened. And maybe someday we'll talk more about that, but uh, I don't want to get too deep into that or I won't have time to go to where I really want to. But we need, we need to remember that God told her that ahead of time. Okay, so, so far the promise has passed from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob. Who are the sons of Jacob? Well, there again, we're not going to read all of this. But Deuteronomy 27, 12 to 23 lists the 12 tribes. The firstborn is Reuben, okay? Now, 
Reuben sinned against his father by having a sexual relationship with his father, concubine Bilhah. And you can find that in Genesis 35, 22 and 49, 3 to 5. And as a result, Jacob took Reuben's birthright away from him and gave it to Joseph. Okay? So because he was the firstborn, he was actually the one with the birthright because that was the Jewish custom. But because he sinned against his father, his father took the birthright away from him and gave his son Joseph a double portion. Why of all the sons did he give Joseph the double portion? Because Joseph was the one who his brother had conspired against and sold him into slavery. And they told their father, Jacob, that he had been killed by a ferocious animal. That God blessed Joseph and he elevated him in Egypt. And Jacob gave Joseph a double portion of his inheritance, one for him, and then he also gave him Reuben's portion. That portion that he had given to Reuben that now became uh, Joseph's double portion went to Joseph's sons, uh, Ephraim and Manasseh. Why? Because uh, Jacob had adopted Joseph's first two sons as his own. Okay, so he took that one portion that came from Reuben and split it and gave half of it to the one son of Joseph and half of them to the other son of Joseph. So they called the half tribes of Manasseh and Ephraim. Okay, trying to show you who Ephraim is. Okay, so um, Jacob foresaw that Ephraim was going to be greater than his brother and I could tell you the story there, but most of you probably remember that whenever he was getting old, Joseph wanted him to bless his sons. So he brought his sons in front of him and he said, bless my sons. And what he normally would do would be take his right hand and put it on the firstborn and his left hand on the second. And he would bless them because the one that he puts his right hand on is going to receive the greatest blessing. Okay. But what he did is he switched hands. So he was actually putting the younger over the older. Why? Because God apparently had told him that Ephraim was going to be greater than Manasseh. You know, the Holy Spirit can speak to us and tell us things that are coming. And I, apparently the Lord had spoken to him and said, Ephraim is going to be greater than Manasseh. So put your right hand on him, even though he's the younger, and bless him. So the other sons, we're not going to get into great detail, just to mention their names, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, and Benjamin. Okay, now we're going to fast forward past the slavery in Egypt, past the plagues, past the exodus from Egypt and the parting of the Red Sea and the wandering through the wilderness and all that kind of stuff. And we're going to go back to Ephraim, okay? Because that's really where I want to get to you to today. So I can't spend too much time on that. But this was the time in Israel's history that they didn't have a king. Moses had led him through the wilderness, through the promised land, to the land of Can Canaan. But he didn't enter the promised land, okay? Um, Deuteronomy 35, 34, 5 tells us that he died in Moab and the Lord himself buried him. Wow, what a funeral. Imagine that, the Lord himself burying you. That's pretty cool. Now, Joshua had spent the early part of his life training underneath Moses, okay? So here Moses goes to be with the Lord, and Joshua had been appointed his successor. And you can see that in Deuteronomy 31, 1 to 8, and 34, verse 9. There again, if you're taking notes, I'm not going to read it because of time. So he takes over from Moses when the Israelites entered into the promised land, into the land of Canaan. And Joshua was from the tribe of Ephraim, okay? The special tribe that we were talking about. He was from the tribe of Ephraim. He was the very first of their conquerors, so he became very famous. And after capturing the land of Canaan, Joshua and the Israelites divided the land up into 12 um, to each of the tribes, okay? And if you read Joshua 18, 1 to 10, it tells us that the Ark of the Covenant and the Tent of the Presence of God was located in Shiloh. And Shiloh was the principal sanctuary during this time of the judges. And it was within the borders that the land uh, that the Lord had given to the tribe of Ephraim. So this was like an honor that this sanctuary was in 
of all of the tribes, it was in the tribe of Ephraim. It was within their border. That's an honor that, that it's there. Ephraim was the largest tribe. Uh, militarily, they were bowmen, which made up the biggest portion of the Israeli army. They were the best armed. They had the best weaponry of all the tribes. Um, they were the most blessed of the tribes. They were the most beloved of the tribes. Everybody looked up to them. Um, some of Israel's most important people came from that tribe, the tribe of Ephraim. They really looked up to them. In fact, the reputation of this tribe was so high that in those days, anyone that was held in high esteem was called an Ephraimite, even if they weren't from the tribe of Ephraim. Sometimes it was like, uh, like an honorary degree because they were so famous. Of course, they were from the tribe of Ephraim, so they were called an Ephraimite sometimes, even if that wasn't the case. And when they went out to battle, they were all that. I mean, they were the ones. They were all of that. But then um, they went out to battle, and something had happened. And that's what I want to look at today. So let's go to Psalm 78, verse 9. All of that to get to this point. The warriors of Ephraim, though armed with bows, turned their backs and fled on the day of battle. When I read that, I was like, what? That doesn't make any sense. This, I mean, this is God's finest. This is the people that everybody looks up to. They're all that. I mean, they're the ones that people want to be like them. But in the midst of the battle, they turn and they run. Why? What in the world is going on? What changed? And when I read that, it puzzled me. It didn't make any sense to me. So I did so much studying on that one verse. I was like a dog with a bone, you know. I was like digging in. And it just didn't make sense to me. And I've learned over the years, if you read a verse like this and something's not clicking, something doesn't make sense, that you should read the verse before it and read the verse after it. And maybe by doing that, all of a sudden it'll start to make sense. Okay, so let's do that together. Let's read the verse bef before that verse. Psalm 78, verse 8. Then they will not be like their ancestors, stubborn, rebellious, and unfaithful, refusing to give their hearts to God. Well, let's read that in the New King James Version. And may not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not set its heart aright and whose spirit was not faithful to God. Okay, so that's the verse before it. Let's jump and read the verse after it. 78, 10, and 11. They did not keep the covenant of God. They refused to walk in his laws and forgot his works and his wonders that he had shown them. Okay, so I'm putting these things together and I'm, I'm reading about this generation. So it seems to me like this became a generational thing, okay? Um, what was a generational thing? Well, from reading these scriptures, it seems to me that they became proud they started to have a haughty spirit. Maybe they heard uh, all the things that people were saying about them, and they started to believe their own press. They started to believe their own publicity. They forgot where they came from. They forgot what God had brought them from and what God had brought them through. And as a result, they developed a rebellious, a treacherous spirit, and they refused to walk in God's law. That's what the scripture said. It was like telling God right to his face, we will not be ruled by you. So if they refused to be ruled by God, then they became ruled by their own heart, their own sinful heart. You're going to be ruled by something or someone. And if you refuse to be ruled by God, something else is going to rule you. And they said, we will not be ruled by you. So they became ruled by their own heart. And guess what? Take God out of the equation. We don't look too pretty inside, do we? I know me. If you take God out of me, it's not too pretty. Anything good in me is only there because of him. And they refused to be ruled by God. So what happened is they started to be ruled by their own heart, their own sinful heart. You know, um, when sin has its way and it's allowed to rule men's heart, it eventually causes men to lose hope and to become disheartened. I feel like that's what's happened in our nation. We were once one nation under God, but we've gone so far from our original moorings that we've become disheartened and we've lost hope. 
used to be we knew where our hope was. One nation under God. We had hope. When they left the shores of uh, the United Kingdom and they headed across the sea, they knew there were dangerous things ahead of them, but they knew they had hope because they were coming here to serve God and to have freedom. And so they had hope. But once we get our eyes off of God, we lose our hope, okay? And we become disheartened. The weapons of war do men little good without the heart of a warrior. And that's gone if God is gone out of the equation, okay? So the reason they ran, the reason why they were cowards, if you want to put it that way, is the shameful violation of God's law and the breaking the covenant that they had made with God. And the fact that they were not grateful to God for all the things that he had done for them and all that he had brought them through. And, you know, that's really forgetting the law, the things that God's done for us is really at the bottom of our disobedience to him. If we forget what God has done for us and what he's brought us through, that's the basis of all of our disobedience. Some of us have forgotten what God has done for us. We've forgotten what God delivered us from. We've walked in his freedom long enough that we've forgotten what it was like to walk in condemnation. We've forgotten where and what we would be if he hadn't died for our sins so that our sins could be forgiven. And maybe people have said kind things to us and we've started to believe our own press. We've forgotten that the only good that they see in us is him. <laughs> you know, we've forgotten that our eternal destiny would be, but for Jesus, the same as someone who's lost. You know, we see other people that don't know Jesus and we look at them and we've forgotten their but for the grace of God go I. You know, and um, we may see people around us that are not living for the Lord. They're living in sin and we forget that we are sinners saved by grace. That's the difference. We're just sinners saved by grace. And if it hadn't been for what Jesus did for us, we'd still have the same hopeless future that those folks have. So we need to look at them with the right eyes. We need to look at them through the eyes of love that Jesus does. We've also forgotten that God's given us a mandate that we're supposed to tell others about what God has done for us. Yeah, we need to tell our children. The Bible tells us we're supposed to do that, but we need to tell others too. Someone told you about Jesus, and aren't you glad that they did? Amen? And someone needs you to tell them about Jesus as well. It might be that it's someone that's never walked with the Lord. Or it might be someone that has walked with the Lord that doesn't walk with the Lord any longer. Now, the Holy Spirit might be talking to you about someone, or maybe he has been talking to you about someone lately, maybe whispering their name in your heart and reminding you about them. And uh, you may know that God has been doing that. He's been talking to you about going and talking to somebody. And um, you haven't done it, you know. You just didn't respond to what he's been telling you. Listen, if the Lord is telling you to speak to somebody and you're refusing to do that when someone's eternal destiny is on the line, I doubt that the Lord takes that very lightly, you know, because uh, we might think, well, this person is only 20. They have a long time ahead of them. I have plenty of time to tell them. Age doesn't mean anything. <laughs> Age doesn't mean a thing. Anything could take them out and, and just like that, you know. So maybe uh, you've had someone on your heart a lot lately, but you're not sure why they were on your heart. Could it be that the Holy Spirit's been prompting you to give that person a call or to go and see them? You know, some people believe that... Um, if you once walked with the Lord and you're not walking with the Lord now, you were never really walking with the Lord to begin with. And I'm going to probably get into that a little bit later. But I don't believe that that's true. You know, here's what people don't need. They don't need you to call them or go see them and put condemnation on them. What they need is for you to love them. If they want condemnation, they can find that anywhere. <laughs> the enemy is constantly putting condemnation on us. Amen. What they need is love. Right. Love speaks very loud. Some people haven't really experienced true Christian love. Uh, John was talking to us yesterday in the men's fellowship. They'll know we're Christians how? By our love. By our love. And we sang that old song. 
We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. And we pray that all unity may one day be restored and they'll know we are Christians. And they'll know we are Christians. Amen. Amen. Um, how loving are you when you're around people? Let me just say something. It's very tempting these days with the stress level being, oh, here. <laughs> <laughs> it's very tempting to let things that wouldn't normally irritate you rub you the wrong way. And maybe not act the way would be normal for you to act a year ago. Because we've just had it. You know what I mean? We've been there and done that and we've had it. And it's very, very easy for you to allow things to irritate you that wouldn't normally irritate you. Um, I think that we need to spend quality time with the Lord and say, God, help me not to do that. If I ever needed your Holy Spirit, now's the time when I need that because I really do want to show the love of Christ to people, but I feel like I could potentially be right on edge at any given time. I find that I, I not every day, not all the time, but there's been times through this last year I've had to just say, Lord, I just need to feel you right now. <laughs> I just need to spend some quality time with you right now. I just need to feel some love right now, God. I'm just a little bit on edge. And I'm not the only one. There are a lot of people. Um, you don't know what just a little bit of love can do for somebody. Because guess what? God has not changed. <laughs> he loves you just as much as he always did. He hasn't gone anywhere. He's right beside you. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He's right there by your side. But some people need to know that. So don't put condemnation on people. For heaven's sakes, let them see the love of Jesus in you. Scripture tells us in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, that in the last days there will be a great falling away. That would mean people falling away from their walk with Christ, right? Let me read this, 2 Thessalonians 2, 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed and the son of perdition. So, like I said, some people believe once you've accepted Christ, you can never walk away from Christ. Listen, Christ will never walk away from you. He will not. But you can walk away from Christ. Okay? Um... There are people that are not serving Christ right now that once did. And the scripture very clearly says here that there will be a falling away. How can there be a falling away from a relationship that you never had, right? So he will never leave you, but you can walk away from him. Folks, we need to stay close to the Lord right now. If there was ever a time. And not only that, we need to be praying for our brothers and sisters and encourage them in their walk with the Lord. Paul told us in Ephesians 6, 18, in the same way, prayer is essential in this ongoing warfare. Pray hard and long. Pray for your brothers and sisters. Keep your eyes open. Keep, your other, keep each other's spirits up so that no one falls behind or drops out. Now more than ever, we need to pray for each other. We need to encourage each other. We need to lift each other up. If we haven't seen somebody for a while, call them and say, hey, what are you doing? Maybe they're not here because they're just nervous about the whole COVID thing. That's okay. But just call them and let them know you still know where they are. You still remember them. You still love them. You know, and, and they're still part of your family, even though they haven't been here. They're still part of your family and you haven't forgotten about them. It's important to do those things. Okay? They need that. They need to know that you care. So, in a way, we are our brother's keeper. If you haven't noticed, the enemy of the soul of our soul is trying every way he can to put a dark cloud of discouragement on people these days. And believe it or not, it didn't take that long for the children of Israel, after all that God had miraculously brought them through, to forget what, um, you know, where they had come from. And they were in bondage as slaves, and God rescued them, but it didn't take them long to forget all of that, Okay. We can be hard on them for that, but truth be told, we're sometimes a little more like them than we care to admit. <laughs> we can forget where we've come from. We forget what God has brought us through. Have you forgotten what God has brought you from, what he's brought you through? Have you looked at others with a judgmental eye rather than 
with a heart of love and a heart of compassion like Jesus wants you to. There but for the grace of God go I. I'm going to ask you at this point, if you just close your eyes, if there's somebody here that either has never given their heart to the Lord or once walked with the Lord, but you don't feel like you're walking with the Lord right now and you need prayer, would you lift your hands up? Okay. Praise God. You can open your eyes. Um, I'm going to pray for people that are listening online that might need that kind of prayer. If you're listening online and you feel like I'm talking to you, that either you never walked with the Lord or you walked with the Lord, but you have walked away from the Lord, I want to promise you, God will not walk away from you. He's not forgotten you. He loves you. He cares deeply about you. But if you feel like you're not serving the Lord right now, I want you to pray this prayer with me. Father, forgive me of my sin. I want to serve you. I know that you love me. I know that you have a purpose and a plan for my life. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I believe that you're the son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose on the third day and that you're seated at the right hand of the Father right now and that you are willing and able to forgive my sins. So I ask you to forgive me and be my Lord and Savior. Amen. Now, close your eyes again. I'm going to go someplace else. If you feel like you have been walking in discouragement, depression, there's a cloud over you, and you need to have release from that, and you need prayer, would you raise your hands? Okay, there's several, several among us. Let me pray for you. Father, you are greater than any situation. There are several situations that are represented in this house. Some of them might seem absolutely impossible. We might look at these situations and say there's no way out. There is a way out. That's a lie of the enemy. There is nothing too difficult for my God. You are the God of the impossible. You are the God of miracles. And I pray for each person who raised their hand and some that are out online listening. I pray for each person, Lord, that as they grab hold of the hem of your garment, just like the woman who had the issue of blood and she had done everything that she could do. She went every place she could go. She spent all that she had and it looked like it was completely hopeless. All she did was grab a hold of the hem of your garment and instantly everything changed. Father, I'm going to ask you to do a miracle in these lives right now. As these people reach out and grab a hold of the hem of your garment, I pray that instantly you will do a miracle in their lives, in their situations, in their circumstances. Father, I pray for answered prayers. I pray for testimonies of your greatness and your goodness. And I pray, Father, that we'll hear of the things that you've done to absolutely change and transform their relationship and their circumstance. I pray, Father, that this will be something that will happen quickly. Lord, that we'll hear of the miracles of what you have done. I pray that right now, Lord, you would shake off uh, the spirit of fear, shake off the spirit of depression, shake off the spirit of uh, discouragement, and I pray for... uh, a supernatural sense of your peace to step into these situations and these circumstances. You are the Prince of Peace. And so we address you at this time as the Prince of Peace and say, Prince of Peace, step into these situations, do miracles among us, only things that only you can do. In your name we pray. Okay, so they're taking Dan Clapp to the ER. I don't know what's going on right now, but let's all pray for Dan right now for whatever the situation is. Father, we pray for Dan. Lord, you know exactly what's going on in Dan's situation. Father, I pray that you would touch his body right now. 
Father, even as they're on their way to the ER, before they even get there, I pray, Father, that you would already go ahead and go before him, Lord, that you would touch his physical body, Lord Jesus. Lord, that you would do a miracle for him. Father, whatever it is, you know what it is, Lord Jesus. I pray, Father, that you would lay your healing hand upon him, Lord. Father, we know that you took stripes on your back for Dan's healing. And Father, we just claim that healing for Dan's body right now, Lord Jesus. We ask you, Father, to touch him wherever he needs to be touched. Heal him wherever he needs to be healed, Lord. We pray for Donna and whoever is traveling with him right now, Lord God, that you would take away anxiety and nervousness and may your Holy Spirit be with them. Holy Spirit, step into that situation. Holy Spirit, go with them and do a miracle, even as they're traveling and even by the time they get there, that they would see that you have already done a work. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Well, folks, I love you. If you need further prayer, I'm here. Other than that, be blessed.